Welcome to our preview of Pocketbook Adventures, a game you can bring with you anywhere. Thanks, David, the designer, for sending us a prototype of this solo game to check out. Now, Pocketbook Adventures is the creation of David David. No, that's not me messing up. That's his name, David David. Now, he's currently crowdfunding a release of this game through Kickstarter, which is live and well-funded already, which is awesome. Now, this is being done through his company, Grumpy Spider Games, and this will be the second game from them. The first being Rucksack, which was successfully kickstarted last year, and from what I understand, in people's hands already. I have not tried that one myself. Now, Pocketbook Adventures is a solo dungeon crawl adventure, with each level taking only 5 to 10 minutes to play through. All that's needed to play is a copy of the game and a pencil. While physical copies are only meant to be played once, through the Kickstarter, you also get PDFs for the entire thing, which you can print out as many copies as you wish. Now, one of the most impressive things about Pocketbook Adventures is the price point. At least right now on Kickstarter, I don't know what the retail levels are going to go be at, but on Kickstarter, it's 12 bucks US, including shipping to anywhere in the US. Now, for those of us outside the US, yes, we do have to worry about shipping, but I got to say, so far, it seems very reasonable. So as we all know too well, shipping costs aren't final until you've received your package. Very true with Kickstarter. So in Pocketbook Adventures, you're presented with a classic JRPG style map filled with terrain, treasures, uh, monsters, and an exit and a starting point. You start from the starting point and move orthogonally around the map, grabbing the treasures, battling monsters, and eventually leaving the map. You are then scored based on how many monsters you've killed, the amount of damage you've taken, and how many stops you made along the way. In addition, in between some adventures, you get to go to town, level up, buy items and weapons. At the end of each section of the adventure, there's also a interesting puzzle-based boss fight for you to get through. Now, due to our copy of a Pocketbook Adventures being a prototype, we didn't do an unboxing video, though it ends up the production version is going to be very close to what we were sent. Yeah. Yeah, there isn't really a lot to talk about here. The entire game's one small pocket-sized spiral-bound book with a surprising number of pages. Uh, actually, to be honest, let's check. Is there a page count in here? And tell you exactly how many pages. Oh, there is not, unfortunately. So I didn't count them. There's at least 50 different areas, 50 different dungeons, and they each take up two pages. So you're looking at at least 100 pages. It's got to be a little bit more. Um, the cover and back are thicker card. Pages are paper. Like, as you'd expect, they're just thin paper. Nothing fancy, but you know what? It works for what this is, and the quality is obviously a big part of what let David set the price point at only 12 bucks. Now, more important to the game itself is that the iconography is clear and easy to read, as are the maps. I honestly have no complaints in regard to quality here. The instructions do take up the first few pages of the book are very clear and easy to understand. In addition, individual quests have some reminders on what specific icons mean. Though I did find for the first couple plays, I kept flipping back to see what things meant. Oh, I crossed over a single gold coin. What's that mean? Oh, get a gold. Oh, I crossed over a pile of coins. What's that mean? Oh, you have to hit the target and see how much gold you get. Like just a bit of referencing for the first couple of plays. Okay. So you've got a single book and a pencil. How does this all work as a solo RPG experience? How do you play Pocketbook Adventures? So playing Pocketbook Adventures couldn't be simpler. Once you read how to play, you flip to the first map. It's set in the grasslands and you begin. Now, each region in the game tells you how movement works. In the grasslands, you move one to four spots in a straight line. If you hit a wall, you turn 90 degrees, your choice left or right, and keep moving. You collect any treasure you pass over, but have to stop if you run into a monster. Now, if you stop in any of the eight squares surrounding a monster, you must fight that monster. Treasure chests require keys to open, and there's one key and one chest on each map, and must be stopped on directly. So to get a chest, you actually have to stop on it, not just pass over. Now, each map includes one exit that you'll need to reach to finish that map. So pretty straightforward. Move, turn, and fight on your way to the exit. Now, treasure you can pick up includes gold, which you can spend later to buy healing items and weapons, hearts that heal you, heart containers that give you additional max HP and a total Zelda vibe, gold piles that reward one to five gold, and various items like remedies that heal status effects and pixie dust, which heals you. 
In general, you're going to want to try to pick up as much as you can before leaving a map. Uh, so, I mean, this is sounding pretty much like a paper version of Rogue, but without yeah. monsters moving on their own. <laughs> yeah, this there's definitely a very roguelike field, except obviously things aren't randomly generated. It's going to be the same every time you play through it, though you're only meant to play through it once. So I guess you're getting that rogue feel and then every map's different when you flip the page. Now, combat in Pocketbook Adventures is one of the most unique and innovative parts of this game. Every monster on the map has a spot on the previous page showing the monster icon, as well as like a line on top of it with a dot. Underneath that is a bullseye style target below it. To attack, you put your pencil tip on the dot, close your eyes, lift off the pencil, and put it down onto the bullseye. You're going to take no damage if you hit the bullseye, one damage for every ring going outward. In addition, each monster has a special attack, and these are shaded in areas of the target, like the bullseye. If you point at one of those, you're affected by whatever the special attack is, which is spelled out on the page. Now, these special attacks include all kinds of fun things, some of which are permanent until you get to use a remedy to get rid of them. Early monster abilities can even help you. For example, the goblin that you fight in the first dungeon, if you hit a special, you scared him and he drops gold. The pixie, if you hit a special there, she heals you. Later monsters, though, are much more punishing, inflicting statuses like sting. You get sting stung, sting stung stung. You get stung twice. You take three extra damage and empty, which means you've got no will to fight and won't heal yourself while you're moving around. Well, that's certainly a fun and innovative resolution system. Mm -hmm. Now, one very real possibility when playing pocket adventures, pocketbook adventures is dying, but it's no big deal in this game. You either lose half of your collected gold or drop your weapon and items. You then go back up to full health and the monster that killed you is still alive. So you're going to have to fight it again. There is no permadeath here in this game. Too bad fans of uh, hardcore mode. <laughs> but I'm sure you could really house rule your own if you really wanted the permadeath. Yeah, there's a, I, I could totally see there being gamers out there who try to play through the entire thing without dying. I'm sure that's a thing. Now, once you finish a map by leaving out the exit, you then get a score. Uh, very, this, this reminds me of playing some type of app, right? You're going to get a bunch of stars. You're going to get up to three stars in three different areas with a maximum of nine points. The first is how many monsters you kill. Next is how much damage you took with, of course, more stars for less damage. And last is how many stops you made on the map with a max score of nine. A pretty simple, some might even say simplistic scoring system. Uh, it doesn't really feel like there's a real range to compete against other players' scores here, though. Uh, well, I can see comparing how you did on individual maps because the scores do range from zero to nine. I think the real comparisons to be done at the end of each section. And well, of course, your final game score, which I'll talk about calculating that later. Like I can totally see someone going online and hey, have you played Pocketbook Adventures? What'd you score in the Grasslands? Okay. Now, after recording your stars, you're going to flip the page and see what's next. I don't recommend looking ahead. It's more fun if you discover it as you're playing. Now, most of the time, this is just going to be the next map. You carry over your health, gold, and items, sorry, health, gold, items, and weapon from the last map and just keep playing. Now and then, though, when you flip, you're going to get to find a town. Here, you can pay gold to level up. Now, you pay a set amount of gold and try to hit a bullseye target. The bigger the target, the more gold you spend. So if, or so, so if you spend seven gold, you got a nice big target to aim for, whereas if you only spend two gold, you got a little tiny target. Well, if you hit the target in any of the rings, you get one max hit point. And each town includes at least three different size targets. Now, one thing I didn't know when I was playing through this that I've now had clarified by the designer is that if you have the gold, you can try more than once. But any misses do mean your gold is lost. Now, in town, you can also heal up, remove status effects, and buy useful items like remedies and pixie dust. Finally, every time you're in town, you get a chance to buy a weapon. You can only ever hold one weapon, and they aren't cheap. Now, weapons give you some form of permanent advantage going forward while it's equipped. For example, my first weapon I bought while playing was a thieves' knife, which meant I didn't have to have the key to open chests, which made it way easier to finish the dungeons in less steps. I later swapped out for something called the Outer Light Sword, which has me draw a little heart in all the monster targets' outer rings. And what it means is I take one less damage when I happen to hit there. 
So for me, the bullseye zero damage, the middle ring is one damage, and the outer ring is only one damage for me as well. So definitely sounds like picking not just a weapon, but your weapon is a vital aspect of the game. Uh, definitely earlier on, but they're going to start teasing you with more and more interesting things. I, this is the one aspect of the game I almost wish I could make a collection of weapons and pick which one to use when I get to the next map. Uh, for example, one of the healing wands is you pick three hearts that are on the board, put a plus in them. Well, those heal too. Well, if I know it's going to be a fight with lots of fights that I'm worried about losing, I would rather have that than my light outer sword, for example. Now, the other thing you can find after flipping the page, and it's usually after quite a few dungeons and a couple stops at town, is a boss fight. Now, there's one of these in each region, and each has special rules for how to play them. Now, to me, these seem like, like, like something that I'd consider a spoiler, so I'm going to leave those for you to discover on your own. Now, after you do defeat the boss, you're going to add up all your stars for that region and then record it at the start. So when you finish the Grasslands boss fight, you go back to the first Grasslands page and record your stars. Um, you then flip the page again and find out where you're delving next. Now, again, I don't want to give too much away, but the big thing that does change in later maps is how movement happens. In at least one region, the game becomes more of a puzzle, specifically one of those slider puzzles where you're going to move in a straight line until you hit something, then you stop. Later in the adventure, you're in the deeper, darker dungeons, and in that point, you're blinded, so movement becomes random, and you actually use the blind pencil point to move. So you literally are on the map, you close your eyes and put a dot, and that's where you move to. And of course, future boss monsters each have their own tricks and systems. Certainly sounds like they didn't skimp on gameplay in this no. small little book. Now, once you finally do get to the end of the book, you total up all your scores for all the regions and you look up on a chart to get your title. Now, what you're getting is three different titles, three parts of your title, and it's for each of the three things you're scoring, right? So there's a, there's a title for how many times, how, how you did exploring, a title for or how much damage you took, and a title for how many monsters you killed. Now, there's a page at the back of the book, like for a memorandum, hey, I finished it, where you fill out your character name and you write down your title and you can save that for prosperity's sake. Okay, well, now that we've heard about the game, let's hear about your overall thoughts on the game. All right, so when David David first reached out to me about this one, I thought the concept sounded pretty neat. This honestly seemed like the perfect thing for me to play while sitting in the car waiting for my mom or the kids at whatever appointment they have each day. Sometimes I feel like more of a chauffeur than a father sometimes. And I was totally right. This game is perfect for that. What I didn't expect, though, was just how much fun playing through one of these short map-based adventures really is. This is honestly the perfect example of a game that actually exceeded my expectations. This sounds like a great game for people who play those idle games on their phone or other time-killer apps mm -hmm. and would like to do something else or have lousy phone batteries. Totally true. Honestly, I found the entire thing to just be physically brilliant, like like just brilliant overall, like the physical design. The size really is perfect for fitting in a, at least denim jeans pocket, which is what I tend to wear. The spiral is wide enough to actually slide a pencil in there, which is nice. And the cover is just thick enough to protect the pages, though what you want to do is leave it open on the last page you're on. That's not great because the paper's kind of thin, so you may not want to toss it in your pocket. You'll probably want to close it first. Now, I do wish the text was a little bigger. It's a little small, but I admit I'm aging and I have aging eyes and that's not going to be a problem for everyone. Uh, there isn't really a lot you need to read once you're actually moving around on the map, though. So it sounds like they dropped the ball a little bit on having a you know custom divider or uh, something to keep your place. Uh, even yeah. something as simple as a small ribbon that you could tie off to the, the rings to drop in. I guess that's easy enough to hack yourself and toss in. Plus, anything that up the price point, I wouldn't want to add to this. Like I say, I think the, the real shining thing in this is the, the amount of game you're getting for the price. As for the rules, they were perfectly clear. Uh, they made perfect sense reading through them for the first time. Uh, though I got to say, they didn't really give me a good idea of how it would feel playing, just how engaging the game is. Like I'm reading, I'm like, yep, you, you move kind of like one of those puzzles. Oh, OK, that's neat. Yeah, I can see how that works. Oh, and if I pass over that, I get, okay, that makes sense. But it's not until you actually play that you see how well that all works together. Right. Well, it's an interesting change from games that tend to oversell in the instructions. Yeah, true. This one 
this one sets the expectations really well. What really does shine here, though, is playing. Like, like actually playing through one of these mazes. Uh, the mechanics here just work, and they work perfectly. Like, the movement system is brilliant. And I got to say, if it's David David or if he had some help, whoever designed those maps did a great job of putting things in just the right spot so there is generally an optimum way to move. I also liked how the difficulty ramped up. Like at first it was really easy to get under the the stop steps. Like what I, 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 like I did this in 16 and I had 22 steps for three stars. How could you take so many more? And while at first you're like, oh, I only have to kill seven monsters. There's like 12 on this board. So I got to pick and choose. But then later on, like one of the, the thing I now do when I go to a new map is I go, okay, what's the, what's the kill target? Okay. I have to kill some monsters. How many monsters on the map? Crap. There's 10 monsters on the map. So to get max points, I got to kill them all. And then it started getting a lot harder on the getting out in time. Uh, one of the key rules is if you go back to a spot that doesn't count, it's the number of spaces you stop on, not the amount of stops. So I definitely got better at backtracking while playing this game. And I really dig it. Like there's, we talked about this on previous podcast episodes and that, that onboarding is something I'd love to see more of in more, more games. And the onboarding on here is is seamless like like a video game you don't realize they're onboarding you but they really are by keeping things easy and ramping them up well it certainly sounds like it got one fan out of all of this at the very least <laughs> yeah uh, it's true uh honestly the the true highlight though that the, the most fun is honestly this i don't want to i want to call it stupid but like the silly blind points pencil point system i don't know i don't have a term for this there should be a term for this new mechanic and we can put it on our giant list of mechanics the blind points pencil point or something like it just sounds silly, but it works so well. And I have played this game like sitting in a car with it, you know, up against my steering wheel. I've done it laying down on the couch with it kind of floating above my head. And I played sitting at a table and this pointing system works for all of these. Now, I do recommend if you are like covering your book, you just, you know, have it in half. Don't try to play it with both pages open because it's a little floppy that way. but. It would still work, though. I will say using the table, I was a little more accurate. So maybe if you want the best score, you might want to try to play on the table. Now, the other thing I do dig about this is that it's now relegating your combat results to actual player skill. Like this is really it's a mini dexterity game. And I think I prefer this to say the randomness of dice. Because I got to say, I have been way happier and shouting out loud for hitting a bullseye when I only have one health left. And I can remember ever being happy, say, rolling a 20 in a game of D&D at the right moment. And I think it's because I know I did it. I pointed that pencil. Look, I nailed it. I got the bullseye. And actually, if you watch the video on their Kickstarter page, they highlight a bunch of people playing the game that are either hitting or missing right on and their reactions. Like I literally shouted out enjoy in my car and line for the kiss and ride at my daughter's school and got a bunch of sidelong glances from the other parents at the time because I was so happy that I survived a particular attack. Now, that being said, I suspect that this does, to a small part, limit those who will find this game playable. Certain limiting yeah. abilities may impact your ability to perform this accurately, while rolling a dice might not be an issue. If you do have any sort of grasping or dexterity control issues, this may not be right for you. Yeah, actually thinking about that, it's kind of sad they didn't give you an alternative system just in case, because like we personally know a player who would not be able to play this game because of handshaking issues. And and I can totally see that, which is something as an able person I didn't even consider. So it's something, you know what, I'll, I'll send a message off to David, David, just say, hey, you might want to include some kind of die result table or something just in case. For people who can't do that. Now, the final thing I do want to call out in regards to Pocketbook Adventures is the fact it hasn't gotten boring. Uh, my biggest concern with this game when I first signed up to review it was that I thought it would feel the same game after game. But David's done enough different things with this game to keep it interesting. Now, this includes different monster types and terrain on different maps. Not once is the same set of three monsters you're facing. Uh, the various different status effects that the monsters do, and then later in the game, completely different movement systems and the unique boss fights. Well, I will admit, after I play like three in a row, I'm kind of done for now. I don't need feel like playing a fourth, but I'm always ready, willing, and excited to go back, say, a day or two later. So it sounds like it's well done for a sort of daily uh, coffee time play or 
tea time, if we want to go back to the Gale references, yes. uh, before work or, or on your lunch break. Not too much, just enough if you just, you know, get a little bit of time in there every day. Yeah, with games only taking 5-10 minutes, it's perfect break time game. Now, normally, we like to highlight the good and the bad in our previews. And honestly, it's kind of hard to come up with much bad to say about Pocketbook Adventures. Uh, the biggest problem in this game here is you can only play this once. Like, this is actually a problem for Deanna and I, because Deanna saw me playing and was like, okay, that actually looks pretty cool. Can I try? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't want you to play my next map. I want to get my own score. Um, so what I actually did is I went in and completely erased my first map and then let her play through it. But then, like me, she was hooked. She's like, okay, now I want to keep playing. And I'm like, well, what do I do? Do I go through and erase every game after I play it? And and then we just track our stars separately? Like, I guess that works. Um, of course, the real answer is pick up a second copy, right? Like, get one for Deanna. Um, and while my prototype doesn't have it there, there's a, there's a placeholder. There will be a QR code in the back where you can do that, where you can order additional copies or download the print. Maybe print and place, excuse me, Maybe print and play is our solution, but it just it's such a nice one and done book that I hate print and play uses a full eight and a half by 11 sheet and it's kind of in the middle and I'm not going to take the time to bind all that. I don't know. It, it It's it, it, this is a one and done product, really. That's how it's designed. And it's going to take you a while. Like I said, there's, there's what, 100 maps in here, it looks like. So it's going to take you some time to get to the end, but it is a one use product. Uh, honestly, for me, this was kind of the deal breaker. Now, while it's certainly better than some of the escape room games uh, that all have all sorts of components and things and a much higher yeah. price point, I really am disappointed that I can't pass it on and let someone else try and beat my score. Yeah, that's fair. Now, one hack we did think of is don't use a pencil, use a pen or use colored pencils and then play with different colors. So like I go through and I play with uh, with a green pencil and then D goes through and plays with the red pencil. I think that might actually work. Although you, 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 you know, whoever played second would be, yeah. you know, having a, an idea of, of sort of best solutions or possible. Oh yeah, there is that too. Yeah. yeah. You might be giving away your strategies. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. Especially on the puzzle levels. Yeah, I can totally see that. Um, the other problem I can see with this particular product, though, I think at this point, anyone who's even looking at this game has already bought into this fact is this is a solo experience. Um, th this is not a big book. This isn't isn't something I can see working well as a group. Like, I guess you could kind of put it down in the center of your table and have everyone kind of look at it and go, OK, which way should we move? And then, like, maybe pass it around when people can do different combat. But, you know, what? I can't see it. This, this is a solo game. It's meant to be played that way. Yeah, I, I think at least uh, that part is pretty clear. You'd have to really stretch to try and pick this up for more than one player. Like, I suppose if you had the print and play and printed it out on, like, le stretch to ledger size paper, you could do yeah. it. But, uh, yeah, no. But even then, like, oh, who, do we should we go up, down, or left, or right? Like, I honestly, I've seen streamers play this game now, and that's what they kind of did with their chat, which kind of works. So it can be a group experience. Like, honestly, for me, like, this is the my my alone time when I'm trying to kill times game. And when I have other people to play games, I'll go play a multiplayer game. Yeah. All right. Overall, Pocketbook Adventures, honestly, is one of the best game experiences playing through it. Here's what here's one of my completed maps for those of you who are actually here watching is actually one of the best gaming experiences I've had this year. And I'm, me saying this, it's a solo game. This is a fantastic product that does exactly what it sets out to do. It gives you a book full of dungeons and puzzles to explore on your own, a book that you can easily toss into a pocket, into your gym bag or whatever, probably fit this in a dice bag, and you can bring it with you almost anywhere and play anytime you got 10 minutes free. It only requires you to have a pencil on hand, and through that brilliant blind pencil pointing system, I think that's what I've decided it's called, it's the BPP system, um, it lets you experience a puzzle-based RPG experience. It's kind of got that JRPG feel. Uh, with plenty of variety as you get through the book. If you're at all interested in ever playing a solo dungeon crawler, I encourage you to head over to Kickstarter right now and back Pocketbook Adventures. Only $12 US, and that includes US shipping. Like, this is really a no-brainer to me. I know I have already gotten more than $12 worth of fun out of my book so far, and I'm not even halfway through. 
really the only people who shouldn't be checking this out are people who are completely and totally against playing anything solo. But honestly, I kind of even want to go to them and show it to them and say, hey, just try it. And I have a feeling it's going to win over some people who are like, ah, solo games stink. I have a feeling this could win you over. Now, if you are on the fence, if you've heard all this and I haven't sold you on this, take this challenge. Go to the Kickstarter page, download the sample page. That'll let you try it for yourself. It's actually the first Grassland dungeon in full. You can try it out yourself and let me know if it's sold you on it. Well, that's it for our review of Pocketbook Adventures, which is live now on Kickstarter. So far, this is our biggest surprise of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, what's impressed you the most in 2022? Let us know in the comments below. Now, before I go, I also want to invite you to check out my written review of Pocketbook Adventures, which will be posted over at tabletopbellhop.com once it goes live. I get into a little bit more detail of how things work and share lots of pictures from my actual book. 